Okay. All right. And our, for our missionaries tonight, now, I'm going to just call him Jack. You see that? I don't know y'all can't see it, but there's a name about that long on there. I can give you a gist of what it is. Wada, Anna, Ah, Wong, Sa, Wong. That's his last name. He and uh, Prina Puak Pong, uh, and they're, of course, they're over in Asia. That's, that's, that's their home. That's why uh, you know that it's kind of a native name for those folks over there. But he and his wife, on March 11th, on 2011, there was a tremendous earthquake over in uh, that area that killed just tons of people. And they saw it on the news of, of what had happened with the earthquake and the tsunami. And then they had a nuclear plant um, meltdown over there. It was a disaster. And when they saw this on the knee, they never had any intention, what the story of them says, of ever going over there and doing anything like this. But when they, they saw this, they began to pray. And they began to pray for those folks over there. And then they pray, began to pray and ask God what God would have them do uh, concerning this matter with the Japanese. And so after that, God talked to them as they prayed. And God sent them over there to help those folks over there. They said, after praying, we felt the Lord calling us into mission work uh, over there in Japan. And there, it says they immediately said yes because God had already been talking to their heart because of what they'd already seen about the great disaster for those folks over there. And then it says this, and I think we know this by talking as much as we do about missionaries and, and foreign places and all. It says that in Japan, when somebody becomes a Christian, they more often experience persecution by the rest of the people over there if they find out that they're Christians. And he says, this is why Jack and Prina prayed that when God would save someone, and this was their prayer, this is a pretty specific prayer, that they would save the whole family so that one person in the family wouldn't be pushed out. And as they began to go over there and uh, do mission work, all of a sudden, this, that was what began to happen. Whole families uh, were getting saved over there. And they, they said that in one situation, they had a family. This is pretty amazing. From three generations, three generations that came to know the Lord. That means daddy, children, grandchildren, all would come to know the Lord. And it says that they have since led others to Jesus and are now leading a group each day in their apartment over there, wherever they are. And so it's a pretty amazing thing that you see something on television that is a disaster, truly. And you ask God what you can do, and then God sends you over there. That's a pretty amazing thing. And then you go. Over there. That's a pretty amazing thing. So we need to keep, they're not the only ones like that. Uh, and I, I tell you this a lot, but I don't have to. You know it. The world is a very dangerous place. No matter where you're at anymore, it's much more dangerous than it's ever been. And so our missionaries, they're probably in more dangerous situations than they've ever been. We talked to... Uh, I believe it was two or three weeks ago, we talked about some missionaries in Haiti that were killed, right? They killed some of our missionaries over in Haiti. So, uh, but they still go uh, because they follow the Lord. So we need to always keep these folks in our prayers. We need to support them, and we do with the money our church gives uh, through the cooperative program. We, we support them, and, and, and God blesses because of that. But let's, let's take these folks in uh, prayer. And not only them, but all of our other missionaries, wherever they are. Father, I thank you because, God, we could never completely do your word that you have for the church 
if it were not folks like this that were willing to go anywhere and tell people about Jesus. God is our Sunday school lesson today. Talked about the first church and, and the message that you had for the folks of that day. And Lord, uh, when I thought about the lesson this morning and read about these folks, uh, it's almost like the Christian religion in Acts was just so new and people didn't know what to do about it. This is almost like that, going to a place like that where folks don't know about Jesus and they don't know about you, and then these folks come in there and tell them about you, and then, God, you work in their lives. So I thank you for all of these folks, not only these, but all of our missionaries everywhere at home, uh, in the state, in America, and all other countries in the world, that as we approach these last days that are willing to go into dangerous situations, God, we always pray that you protect them, God, that you provide for them, and that, God, you give them souls for their labor. For it's in Christ's name that we do humbly pray. Amen. All right, Mimi's going to come and, and lead us in our song tonight, and our ushers will come forward and, and uh, take up our offering for tonight, okay, for our missionaries. This time we're going to to have our special music tonight, and Casey is going to come and and sing for us tonight, and then we'll get to the message of the financial signs of the end of time. Thank you, Casey. You come on, sing for us, girl. It'll be 
hands on but haven't you heard you can't change god's word mankind better leave it alone now i'm living proof that the bible is true and that's what i'm standing on you've come too late to tell me stone. I like that, Casey. Thank you so much. All right. I want to talk to you tonight. We started uh, uh, last Sunday night. Remember, we started out talking about the microchips, and we started talking about the finances and uh, a lot of things about that, how people that already, thousands of people had already had these chips and stuff in their hand. We began to talk about the money and the financial situation in the world as the world comes closer to the end. Now, it's very difficult many times, and you have to be careful when you do the kind of preaching like this, in making definite statements about what future events are going to be, because truly, the fact of the matter is we can read the Word of God and have an idea, but God knows exactly how it's going to be and come to with these predictions in the Bible that he's made. But I also believe this. If we read this Bible and we study this Bible, because the Bible tells us this, and we look at the trends in the world that we live in today, Jesus said look for the signs, didn't he? And you'll know that the end is coming. So I believe when I look at the things that I see in the world that I live in today, I can say that there are many things that are going to be very prominent as the world comes to an end, as the tribulation period comes. And when I study this stuff and look at all this stuff, one of the trends that I see is the love of money. Uh, when I was raised up, I never even knew what the love of money was because we didn't have any money. I didn't go to church, so I didn't even know that a scripture like that was in the Bible, that the love of money was the root of not just some evil, but all of it. Now, God made that statement, and that is a bold statement to make. But I can say this. When I read that scripture, I look at the world that I live in today, I believe I can faithfully say that as the end time comes, that money and wealth is going to play an essential part as we come into the end times. Money has pretty much been important to people for a long time. We know that. But I believe in a world that I live in today. Brother Gary, I believe that that is becoming more and more important to people in the world today. Things of this world have become God's things of this world are driving people. This, uh, what we call this consuming of the money. And I believe that there is a day coming when it will be more dominant than it is today. And I'll, I'll take you to the Scripture in a little bit and show that. The Scripture 
that we'll go through maybe tonight or now, I don't know if we'll get through it all night. The, mo- the scripture that we'll get into as we talk about these things will prove to us that money will impact as we approach the end times like it never has happened before in that period known as the tribulation period. So I want to, in the next, tonight, if I get through them all, if I don't, I'll get to them next night. I want to tell you three things about money and wealth and this stuff that the Bible tells us about is the root of all evil. When I think about what I'm talking, this is not an easy study, and I told you that last Sunday night for me. But I believe the first thing that I want to tell you is this. We live in a world, we talk about addiction to drugs or alcohol or or whatever you want to. I'm here to tell you right now, we live in a world that has an addiction to money. It has an addiction to wealth. It has an addiction for things. David Jeremiah, in one of his books that I have, He wrote this, and it kind of bears out what I said, and I very much respect David Jeremiah. David Jeremiah talked about a man named Sam that he was close to. He said, one day Sam, this is his words, called him to his office, was called into his office, and whoever the people were he worked for, said that they were going to give him a $3 million bonus because he had done such good work last year. Well, this did not make Sam happy, he says, because Sam had wanted $8 million. Now, this is what David, this is Jer- I'm reading David Jeremiah now. And he felt angry at the idea of them offering him $3 million. In his words, this is what he said. I was angry because it wasn't big enough. I was 30 years old, had no children to raise, no debts to pay, had really no philanthropic goal in mind. I just wanted money for exactly the same reason as an alcohol needs alcohol, because I became addicted. To money. That's what he said that happened to him. He said one day Sam said he looked into a mirror and he was shattered to see when he looked in the mirror what his life had become. Leaving Wall Street, that's where he worked at. He started a family and he wanted a better life for himself. And he said this few people ever escape the Clutches of greed. So I congratulated Sam for what he did. He turned his life around. Now, folks, there are a lot of people in the world like this guy named Sam. They're greedy. They will do whatever it takes to get money. They lie. They steal. They cheat. They kill. Because we have an addiction in this country of this. We have an addiction for money. We have an addiction for power. We have an addiction for wealth and possessions. We want to have all that we can have. That's an addiction to the society that we live in today. Now, it's very easy when you read verses like this to think of a place that we call Wall Street where all the big money is. It's very easy that we talk about this. But I'll be honest with you, this is something that most people have to grapple with themselves, including most of us. But at the end times, as it approaches, do we be in a period where we will find, the Bible very plainly says, where the world will be very evil, That world will be addicted to the money, and the longer it lasts, the appetite for getting rich and richer and richer and richer will happen. I think we see that right now. 
I think we see that right now. Paul said in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, when he was writing to Timothy, this is a prophecy of the future. Paul said, uh, Timothy, I want you to know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The last days will be very bad times, many of them like the world has never seen. He gives an explanation for this. He said, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, and they will be covetous. They will be covetous. Another translation says that men will love money above everything. In these last days, it will be prominent. They will love themselves, they will be proud, they'll be blasphemers, disobedient to parents, they will be unthankful, and they will be what? Unholy. That's what people will be like as we go through these last days. For the love of money, you go back to the first Timothy, and that's where you find for the love of money is the root of all evil which have caused many to stray. Just loving money. Is there. It says that they are greedy and that they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows because of this money. There's a man named John Piper, and I, I read something that he said. Now, listen to this. He said, God deals with grace, not money. He said, Money is the currency of human resources. So the heart that loves money is a heart that pins its hopes and pursuits and its pleasures, puts its trust in human resources and what it can offer. He says, so the love of money is virtually the same as putting your faith in your money, putting your faith, your confidence, and trust. That money, listen to this, will meet your needs in the days ahead, and that money will make you happy. That is such a true statement there because people believe this money and wealth can insulate me from anything that comes in the world if i've got enough money or i've got enough wealth it will help me handle anything that comes my way that's the process but i'm here to tell you when you get cancer when you have a heart attack when something goes wrong with you, there's a lot of things in life that money ain't worth a flip for. I'm going to tell you that right now. It may get you to high-priced doctors, but money will not heal you. And that's what materialism is. And people think this. If I put my faith in my wealth and in my money, that that will do what? That will buy me protection. That will bring me pleasure. And that will give me power and people that are very wealthy they they when i see them they kind of for me wear their wealth on their sleeves they want you to know they're wealthy they want you to know that they ride around in a rolls royce they want you to know they live in a house got 15 bathrooms in it i'm dead serious who needs 15 bathrooms nobody Go to a hotel, ain't got 15 bathrooms in it. They wear it. They want you to see it. They want you to know that that is what, because they have invested everything that they own, mind, body, and soul, and wealth, and money. Folks, the world is full of those people, and many of them sit up in Washington, D.C. They've gotten filthy rich. By being there. But the problem with all the things I've told you is this. Anything you invest your money in down here is only temporary. Or anything. Somebody will live in your house. Somebody will drive your car. Somebody will own your land one day. It is only temporary. I don't care how much you've got. Rich people die. And somebody else enjoys that, but they've invested all their life in that kind of stuff. And this is what I believe. When we start 
invest in our lives in the things here and the temporary things that we lose our desire for eternal things. Did not the Bible say how hard it was for a rich man to go to heaven? It'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it will be for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. Did not God say that? Yes, He did. And when you invest down here, there's probably a good chance that you ain't investing up there. And that's the eternal, that's the prize up there. That's the culture that we live in today. And in the last days, and this is what I, I didn't quite understand all of this. I was reading a few things on this, and I didn't quite, but maybe I can make it where I can understand it, and maybe you can understand it. What is the one word that is dominating our society now? Inequality. Isn't that it? We live in a world where that's the key word for everything now. Everybody's got to be equal. Everybody's got to live in the same kind of house. Everybody's got to have the same resources. We cannot discriminate against anybody. That's D-E-I, equality. But as the last days approach, and which I believe they are because I, I see this in my world that I live in today. Inequality with money and wealth will be greater than it's ever been in the history of the world as the tribulation begins to come in this world. In Revelation 6 through 9, chapter 6 through chapter 19, it describes the future world that will be coming. It describes things that will occur during this time. In the book of Revelation, it says this, that when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of wheat of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the oil and the wine. What does that mean? As the world approaches the end, and during the seven years of tribulation that are coming, this will be the most unequal world that the world has ever seen. You see a great separation there, that, that sealed judgment that, that God sends. What he is doing here, now you need to get this. God is painting a picture of a worldwide day that is coming. A day that is coming into this world where they will be for the first time in the history of mankind. A worldwide famine. There's not a person or a country, anybody that lives in the world at that time will be affected by what is coming this way. Now understand, this is a judgment from God when it comes, because the world has turned its back. The world has went after all these other things we've talked about. God has been kicked out. So when he sends the black horse in Revelation, that is a judgment from God that is coming. It will be a time, and, and hey, we're already beginning. Hey, for the last couple of years, folks, I want you to understand we're seeing a little tidbit of this. Remember how the grocery shelves have gotten empty? Remember how the prices have gone up? Y'all ain't forgot that, have you? Uh-uh. That's what happens. It's going to get 
a thousand times worse than what it is now. When that black horse comes in there, most people will be forced into, will be forced into poverty, hunger, and despair. It says that a man will work a day. A day's pay is a denarius. And he said he will only be able to buy a little bit of wheat and a little bit of grain, just enough all day to feed his family, and that's it. No cable TV, maybe no electricity. It will just be enough to feed his family, and that's it. No putting savings up, no stashing money back. Every day you come home, you just buy enough food to take home and feed your children. That's a sad day, but it's coming. That's what he means in this scripture here. A quart of wheat for a denarius. Three quarts of barley. A barley in that day. Another translation says this. A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a man a day's pay. A loaf of bread, three loaves of barley will be all that your money for a day's work will buy. We know nothing about that, do we? No. No. People today that live know very little about this kind of stuff. Mainly because the government feeds them everything they want. What happens is, and what he's describing, there's a day coming when what you need will not be available. What your family needs will not be out there. It will just be the basic staple the basic food of life, which is bread, and that is all that will be there and be available. And it is pretty expensive. When you think you work all day long, you can get a loaf of bread with it. That's hard labor, folks. But that's coming in here. Not everyone will be affected equally. I wish our government could hear this because they think we all to be affected equally on everything, and that's a bunch of bunk there. There's a day coming when that's going to get worse. This inequality will get worse than it is right now, that they're trying to change everything and make it better. The regular Joe and the poor people will have nothing. But then he says, at the end of that scripture, do no harm to the oil and the wine. You know what the oil and wine represent here? The rich folks. The rich folks. When I grew up, my grandpa and my daddy used to say this. this is, and I don't know how they knew this, but in life, he used to say, the rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. You ever heard that, Mr. Adrian? The world will see that one day. The world will see that one day. This is a day that he says is coming because of people's love for things. Oil and wine were for the rich people. Oil and wine in the Bible are luxury items. Bread was for the poor people. In short, this is what he's saying. The tribulation period will be a period of extreme, and I hope Washington hears this, extreme economic inequality. So no matter how they try to make it equal, it ain't never going to be equal. It's going to get worse. And they can do all the programs and they can give all the stuff away and they can do all that, but there's a day coming when the government won't have a put stand on or nothing to do because God will do the furnishing of everything. The rich will get richer. The poor will get poorer is what he's saying in here. 
the addiction to things, to money. Now, this is what I think will happen. The reason he says that. We won't touch the wine and we won't touch the oil. Folks that are rich will have enough sense and have enough wealth to store some stuff back. But folks like me that don't have that kind of wealth will be in trouble. But I ain't going to be here, so we won't be in trouble. But I'm telling you, people that don't know Jesus, that aren't millionaires and billionaires and that kind of stuff, they're going to be in trouble. Because the cost of everything, we ain't seen nothing yet when you work for a whole day for a loaf of bread. But many that are addicted to money will hoard their wealth and they will continue to live the luxurious lifestyle for a while. That's why don't touch the wine. Don't touch this stuff. They'll still have that. In the United States of America and around the world, the world has displayed this exactly what I'm talking to you about. I'm going to give you a couple of statistics, and I'm going to leave. And I hope next Sunday night I'll tell you what we need to do. I actually had three parts. This is the first part. According to the, gr- the largest credit go- group in the world, 1% of the world's current population owns 44% of all the world's wealth. 1% on 44% of the wealth. That's the trillionaires, the hundred billionaires, and, and those kind of folks that are there. And the higher you go up with it, it gets worse. Financial equity is never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Now, what started us in this mess we're in with that? COVID did, didn't it? COVID has done more damage to this world than most anything that ever happened in this world. Most people will not want to recognize that, but it had. Why? Because when COVID came, millions of Americans lost their jobs. Many businesses closed their doors. Millions of Americans lost. But listen to this. The net worth of a billionaire grew 35% during COVID. A billionaire's wealth grew 35% during COVID on May the 21st, 2021. And I want you to listen to this. This blowed my mind when I read this. How many of you are here in here? I don't know. I ain't saying nothing bad, so I guess it's all right. How many of you in here know Jeff Bezos? He owns Google. <laughs> He's one of the richest men in the world. Let me, let me listen to this. During the COVID crisis, the wealthiest saw the biggest price profits during this crisis that they'd ever seen. Jeff Bezos saw his personal fortune raise an astonishing $86 billion in the, a year after COVID began. How would you like for your wealth to raise $86 billion in one year? Does that not just say what the Bible I just read you about the oil and the wine? No matter what comes, he'll have enough money to get what he wants. He is the first person in the world to be worth over $200 billion. That blows my mind. I can't even imagine a money, a figure like that. So, the rich do get richer, don't they? Daddy was right. 
The poor do get poorer. That's in the Bible. As the tribulation grows near and the end comes, it will be even worse than it is now. The love of money. That's the first point I want to make. That's tonight. I'll get to point two next Sunday night. I don't watch Mike, I hate to tell you this, but I'm Mike's newsman, but I don't I don't watch the news as much as I used to. I really don't have a lot to tell you, Mike, about what's going on. I just read that book. And I just believe what that book says. I look at the news of the world and the economy and all that junk today, and I think when I read Scripture like that, hold on, folks. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. I see all these average, and I hope you, if you got them, it's fine. I don't. Where you always seeing these people take your money and buy gold with it, buy gold with it, buy gold with it, buy gold with it. And that's okay, I guess. I don't know anything about that. I just know I ain't had no money to buy no gold. That's all I know. <laughs> How much gold costs? I ain't had no money to buy none of that. But one day, gold won't be worth a dime. That's, that's right. That's exactly right. But didn't, don't you see it all over the world? People just hungering for more and more and more. You've heard the old saying when they ask a, a rich man, a millionaire, a billionaire, we don't, hey, there are tons of millionaires now in the world. You know that. All over the world. Millionaires be anybody now. So we've moved up a step to billionaires. Everybody's trying to be a billionaire now. Athletes, many of them are billionaires now. It's an amazing thing to me. Because that kind of numbers and money, it, it has a hard time sinking this little simple head here. I don't even know how many zeros there is on that stuff. But one day, all that will pass. And this is what I think. I'm, I got to stop. I see those guys on TV talking about taking money and buy gold. And this is the weird mind that Jimmy Holly has. I think of heaven. And I say, we're going to trample all over gold up there. Gold ain't going to be nothing but a doggone brick up there. We're going to make sidewalks out of gold. We're going to make roads out of gold up there. Men go crazy for him. One day we're just going to walk on it. That's heaven. So all I'm saying is, it's easy to get caught up in that kind of stuff. You need to plan. You need to prepare. Do the best you can. Remember that old saying, if you ask a rich man how much it'll take to make him happy, how much do you need to make you happy? And what's his answer, Jimmy? Just a little bit more. No matter what I got, I just need a little bit more to make me happy. That's a sad state there. When that becomes the goal of the world, the world becomes crooked. Because people will sell their souls for a dollar now. A dollar. Politicians... Through all these packs and people that try to do anything, they sell their souls. Not for a dollar, but for millions of dollars. I doubt there's anyone up there that ain't a millionaire many times over. People will lie to you. They will steal from telemarketers, con people. You got to be careful. Why? They won't take your money. What little, and you know who they prey on? Us regular folks. 
And they ain't going after Jeff Bezos, I can tell you that. Man, he's got more money than anybody do. But they'll come after Jimmy. But as Christians, we just need to focus on God. I don't want God to ever get me tied down to things. To things. Any questions? Anybody want to say anything? I'm, I'm going to quit. Time's gone. All right. Next Sunday, I'll give you the second part of it next Sunday night. This stuff will never get talked on in 99.9% .9 of the churches. They say, well, you need to keep that stuff at the pulpit. Why? Ain't I read you a ton of Scripture tonight that dealt with that? It's in the book. In the book. It ain't popular, but it's in the book. All right, if you have your prayer sheets tonight, um...